By 1985, the remote and extremely dangerous west face of the Ciula Grande in the Peruvian Andes was still unclimbed. But in 1985, two very ambitious climbers, 25-year-old Joe Simpson and 21-year-old Simon Yates, decided they were going to be the first to conquer it. And by all accounts, they seemed up for the job, having already conquered numerous difficult Scottish ice cliffs, as well as a number of large mountain faces in the Alps. So in early June of that year, the pair flew to Peru, and they arrived at the base camp that was nearest to the Ciula Grande, but it was still five miles away, so they couldn't actually see what they were going to be climbing yet. On June 5th, when the weather was good enough, the pair left camp and worked their way around the huge lake, across the glacier, to the base of this cliff they're about to climb, and when they saw it for the first time, they couldn't believe how steep and dangerous it looked. But over the next three days, they managed to make it up this cliff, despite a blizzard hitting them halfway through, and they reached the summit. To them, this was a crowning achievement. They had done it, but in reality, the thing that people would remember them for was not for reaching the top of Ciula Grande. It was for what happened when they started going down. Because of how steep this mountain was, and because of the blizzard that was not going away, it was actually getting worse, the descent was going to be much more challenging than the ascent. So shortly after 10 a.m. on June 8th, Joe and Simon left the summit and began very carefully making their way down the mountain. At 11 a.m., disaster struck when Joe lost his footing and fell to the bottom of an ice cliff and shattered his leg. Initially, they both assumed this was a death sentence for Joe because there's no way he can actually climb down the mountain now, and certainly Simon can't actually carry him down the mountain. They were so high up, and it's so steep. There's just no way. But Simon wanted to at least try to save his friend, so he climbed down to him. He gave him some mild painkillers that he had, and then he attached his rope to Joe, and then Simon anchored himself in the snow Snow, and he began lowering Joe down the mountain, all 300 feet of his rope. And when he would stop, Joe at the other end would anchor himself in the snow with his ice picks. And then Simon would climb down to Joe and he'd repeat the process. This went on for hours and hours and hours, just backbreaking work for Simon. And Joe, meanwhile, is in excruciating pain from his broken leg. And to make matters worse, the storm had gotten so bad that the visibility between Simon and Joe was zero. So as Simon is lowering Joe, he can't see what he's lowering Joe onto, but they had no other choice. That was the only way they could get him down. And so at 5 p.m. that night, Simon accidentally lowers Joe over a cliff. And Joe, as soon as he's hanging off the edge, all of his weight is on the rope, and suddenly the rope is flying out of Simon's hands. He manages to self-arrest and stop him from careening over the edge. But now Simon is the only thing holding Joe from tumbling to his death. And so they're in the middle of this inhospitable environment in the middle of the night, a storm is raging, it's freezing cold, they can't communicate with each other, they can't hear each other or see each other, and Simon is just hoping that Joe is going to be able to grab onto something and kind of take his weight off the rope, otherwise this is going to end badly for both of them. But unfortunately the cliff was at an angle, so Joe was dangling off of it and he couldn't touch the wall, he had nothing to grab onto, he was just dangling in the air. And so as Simon tries to move the rope to try to signal to Joe to take Take your weight off the rope. Joe is trying to climb up the rope, but his hands are starting to get frostbit. He's weak. He's in pain. He can't do anything about it. So for the next two and a half hours, Simon is desperately trying to regain an anchor in the snow. But every second that goes by, he's getting pulled farther and farther and farther down the mountain. He can't see how close he is to the edge. He knows he's getting close. And so finally, at 7.30 p.m., with no other option, he pulls out a knife and he cuts the rope. As soon as the rope was cut, Simon fell backwards. He was safe. Nothing was pulling him off the cliff any longer, but he knew he had just sent Joe to his death. Except Joe didn't die. When that rope was cut, he fell 150 feet and smashed into the ground, except what he hit was a thin sheet of ice that broke from his weight, and he fell another 80 feet into this massive ice crevasse. Joe was knocked unconscious from the fall, but when he woke up, he was laying on his side. He opened his eyes, and he looked around, and he couldn't believe he was alive. And he's looking around, he doesn't know where he is, it's totally dark. He turns on his headlamp, and he realizes he's fallen into an ice crevasse, and he looks down, and he's on this little ledge that's overlooking a much, much deeper fall. He looks down, and this ice crevasse seems to just go on infinitely into this black chasm. So it's a miracle he's alive, but now he's trapped in the middle of an ice crevasse 80 feet down. He can't go down and he can't go up. Now, even though Joe wasn't mad at Simon for the decision he made because he understood it was the right one, he felt so alone. He was so sad. And for a little while, he just kind of freaked out and screamed and yelled and really just didn't know what he was going to do. And then after 
after that, he sat down knowing he wasn't getting out of here and that he was going to die a slow, horrible, painful death. Joe remembers reaching up and turning off his headlamp, which retrospectively he thought was kind of goofy because he's just realized he's about to die inside of this crevasse and he's saving batteries. But with the light off, he's sitting on the ledge and he hears all the sounds that are coming from inside of this crevasse. It was this awful grinding sound, like a moaning sound. And he said it was so terrifying sitting in the darkness listening to the sound that he reached up and turned his light back on just for comfort. Back up on the mountain, Simon was devastated. He felt like he had just killed his friend. And even though he understood why he did it and understood it was probably the right decision, it didn't change the fact that he felt incredibly guilty about it. And so that night, he didn't even move from the position he was. He dug a little snow cave and he laid down and eventually fell asleep. The next morning when he got up, he began moving his way down the mountain and he finally rounded the area where Joe had been hanging off of that cliff and he got a chance to look down and see where Joe might have wound up. And to his horror, he's looking down and he sees this massive opening to a crevasse that seemed almost bottomless. And now this confirms that Joe definitely has died because he fell in there. But nonetheless, Simon goes down and goes to the edge of the crevasse and yells into Joe. He's screaming for him to call out if he's still alive. But after a while, he never heard anything from Joe. And with a heavy heart, Simon turned around and started heading back to base camp. A little while after Simon had left, Joe finally woke up. He had been asleep when Simon was yelling down for him. And so Joe wakes up, he's looking around, he can't believe this wasn't a bad dream. He starts yelling for Simon because he doesn't know what else to do. But after a while, he realized Simon's not gonna come down here to get me. He cut the rope, he thinks I'm dead already. At this point, Joe decides he needs to try to climb out of the crevasse even with a broken leg. And so he gets himself in position, he gets his ice picks, and he starts making his way up this ice wall, but he can't put any weight on his broken leg and he keeps falling down and he's realizing, I can't climb this. And so Joe had two choices. He could wait on the ledge and hope to be rescued, but by his calculations, it was unlikely someone was gonna come out here and rescue him anytime soon because Simon is gonna say he's dead. So wait on the ledge and probably die a slow, painful death or he can go down deeper into the crevasse, which he has no idea where it goes, and hope somewhere down in that black void, there's an opening that leads back out to the outside of the mountain. So he made his choice, screwed an anchor into the ice, put his rope through it, he tested it to make sure it would hold his weight, he looked down into the void one last time and knew that as soon as he stepped off of this ledge, he could not come back up again. This was a one-way trip. And if he made it to the bottom of his 300-foot rope and he didn't find a ledge or a tunnel or something to put his feet on, he would slip off and fall to his death on purpose. He did not put a knot at the end of his rope because he figured either I'll find a way out or I won't but at least it'll be quick. Down he went about 80 feet into this pitch black crevasse. He has no idea what's down there. And he gets to a point where the walls kind of come together and he was able to squeeze through it. And he realized once he got through that point, it was like the center of an hourglass where below it, it kind of opened up. And as soon as he pushed through, he could actually see to the ground. He saw flat ground and there was light shining on it, which meant there was a hole leading out into the mountains somewhere down there. And so he went all the way down, he touched the bottom, it was solid ground, he disconnected from his rope, and he climbed his way up this incline to where the sun was coming in, which was this hole that led right back out onto the mountain. And sure enough, he crawled out and tumbled out, and the sun is shining on him, and he remembers just laying on the mountain, looking at the sun, and laughing. He couldn't believe it. But after the initial relief of not dying wore off, he realized he was not out of the woods yet. He still needed to climb down the rest of the mountain, and there wasn't that much left to climb. He was towards the bottom, and it wasn't that steep. But after that, he would need to navigate five miles back to base camp. But over several delirious, painful, miserable days, he managed to crawl all the way back to base camp, and he got there right as Simon was packing up the tent and getting ready to leave. He could not believe he saw Joe alive. Joe said Simon just swore. He just endlessly swore. He was cussing. He couldn't even speak. He didn't understand. It was like he was looking at a ghost. But after that kind of crazy initial interaction, Simon just gave Joe a big hug and Joe and Simon just cried and held each other. Joe underwent six surgical operations to repair the damage done to his leg and doctors would tell him that you're never going to climb again and you're probably going to struggle with walking for the rest of your life. But after two years of intense rehabilitation, Joe was not only walking just fine, he was mountain climbing. As for Simon, he managed to leave the mountain without any serious physical injury, but he carried with him an enormous sense of guilt that he still carries today. 
Joe consistently says Simon made the right decision. In every interview he does, he always makes sure to say Simon is not at fault. It was an impossible situation. He made the right call. Joe wrote a book about the experience called Touching the Void, and it sold millions of copies worldwide and has since been adapted into a major motion picture. As for Joe and Simon, apparently they've drifted apart over the years, but they still consider each other friends. Just know that I really appreciate your support, and until next time, that's going to do it. See ya.